Carpenter. I am your host this afternoon. My name is Shianwa Desire Kahiha. Um, as per usual, we, we start off with our COVID update, but unfortunately at this point in time, um, we cannot bring it to you currently. It might be uh, available to us a little later on in the show. We will inform you on that one. Getting back to our show for the afternoon, recently Namibia, very recently, which is Monday, Namibia celebrated its 32nd birthday uh, since independence. A lot of things have happened with regards to our development, our growth, uh, and our democracy. And today we are looking at Namibia's 32 years of independence in perspective. And to assist me in uh, tackling this particular topic, I have a healthy panel here. Um, representing various uh, of our omas and we have Mr. Mubusisi Mavuku. He is the Deputy Chief National uh, Development Advice, Microeconomic Analysis and Model. He is from the National Planning Commission, shortly NPC. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for being with us. We also have Mr. Ngidinwa Daniel. He is the Executive Director with the Ministry of Urban and Rural Development. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. And uh, we also have Ambassador uh, Jerobium Shanika, and he is the Acting Head of Multilateral Relations and Cooperation Development with the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperations. Shortly, Mirko. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for our panelists for being with us. Uh, it is a lengthy uh, set of questions, answers, discussions, but do be reminded as a viewer, you are also welcome. If you have questions for any of our panelists to communicate with us, uh, we are live streaming through our social media platforms. On Facebook, you can find us at Ministry of Information and Communication Technology Republic of Namibia. That's Ministry of Information and Communication Technology Republic of Namibia. We are also present on our YouTube channel, and our handle there is M-I-C-T Namibia. M-I-C-T Namibia. Getting back to the topic, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you very much for being with us, and we kick it right off. Uh, Mr. Mavuku, we would like to hear from you. The theme for this year's independence celebration or anniversary was a people united for prosperity. What motivated this theme? Thank you very much for the question. Yes, I think uh, in short, uh, the, the theme uh, is basically a rallying point to mm. all Namibians, you know, working together for a common goal. Mm. And I think uh, we, if we all uh, reflect from uh, uh, Namibia's vision, vision statement, you know that we, it's, it, it talks, uh, indicates that uh, Namibia aspires uh, to be an industrialized and prosperous country mm -hmm. developed by her human resources, enjoying peace, political st stability, and harmony mm -hmm. by the year 2030. So in a nutshell, that, 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 that was at the, the heart of the theme. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well put, uh, a short, simple, but definitely impactful with regards to why that particular theme. Um, Mr. Daniel, um, under the Harambe Prosperity Plan, there are various pillars that we find um, in that particular living document. And uh, many are really geared up to try and guide us, give guidance in the movement of One Direction as a country as we progress into prosperity, as the theme says. We've got a social progression pillar, and it has four sub-pillars under which it stands, and this uh, is the elimination of hunger and poverty, fast-tracking of uh, uh, delivery of serviced land, to urban areas, improved sanitary conditions countrywide, the reduction in infant uh, maternal mortality, and the acceleration of vocational technical skills. Uh, we would like to hear from you with regards to your part under this pillar. What are some of these that you have struggled with? And um, you can give us comparisons from as far back as, as, as you would like to highlight on, seeing that we are covering uh, a time period of 32 years. Oh, thank you, thank you for, for, the, for the question. And just to add on to what my colleague has responded to, mm. uh, the constitution of the Republic of Namibia obliges the state mm -hmm. to proactively uh, devise measures to 
to enhance the welfare of the citizens. Mm. And it is on that basis that prosperity continues to be one of those guiding principles. Yeah. Now, as part of that prosperity then, um, back to the sector you know, which I represent, which is urban and rural development, yeah. then access to decent and affordable housing is one mm. of, the, of the requirements. The other one is access to land, especially mm. urban land. And then the third one, uh, focal area, is that of access to proper sanitation. Yeah. Um, and, and, and with that, I would like to start off by giving you just some figures in terms of what we have done since 1992, mm -hmm. practically since independence. Yeah. And in, you know, in the area of housing, we were able to deliver to date, up to the end of last, last year, we were able to deliver uh, close to 70,000 housing units mm. uh, that, that we were able to deliver. And this is mainly... Uh, through the efforts of the central government, together with the state agencies such as in the NHE, mm. as well as in partnership with uh, uh, community-led organizations such as the Shark Dwellers and Namibia Housing Action Group. Mm. And uh, that, you know, those units were delivered with a total investment of close to $5 billion Namibian dollars mm. over that period. Um, in the area of access to urban land, um, we were able to deliver close to 41,000 uh, plots that were serviced, and that has, uh, you know, um, come as a result of uh, an investment of 6.9 billion Namibian dollars. Mm. Uh, in the area of sanitation, uh, which is uh, both urban and also um, uh, rural, um, we can, in terms of rural development uh, site, we have been able to, through regional councils, to build uh, about 14,000 um, mm -hmm. what we call ventilated uh, pit toilets. Mm. Um, but a large part of the you know, our approach to improvement of sanitation among the community is actually to engage the community mm. because that is the only sustainable way that we'll be able to deliver on that desire. So we are following what we call community-led total sanitation mm. where the government through the Ministry of Urban, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Works, uh, sorry, Ministry of Agriculture, Mm -hmm. Ag uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform, mm. um, we, we trigger the communities and help the, and then assist the communities to be the one to actually uh, do the, you know, the construction of, the, of their own toilets at the, you know, at the household level. Yeah. So I think in a nutshell, this is, uh, this is what I want to indicate. Um, we can talk about later uh, in terms of the Harambe Prosperity Plan you know, 1 and 2. Yes, uh, what yes. we have delivered, but in terms of um, since independence, these are the this is what we were able to do. Yeah. And I just wanted to again just highlight that these numbers that we are giving you are specifically based on the interventions that are funded by government. Mm -hmm. It does mm -hmm. not include the opportunities and access to land that has been provided by the government, but which but which opportunities were actually delivered by private sector. Yeah. Uh, so private sector will go to a local authority and then they acquire a piece of land mm. and the government through the minister and through other bodies that regulate uh, access to land will then provide approval. Yeah. And that approval has really facilitated and created those opportunities. So we are not counting those other uh, units, which is quite a large. If you yeah. see there's so much sectional titles being developed by private developers, but it's not part of that number that I've given you. Okay. Okay. No, definitely, it, it, it is a pro it's a promising uh, um, approach with regards to something is being done. We might not have done everything. Not everybody will agree that you know we we've arrived, but there is progress. There's movement. Thirty two sure. years might seem like a lot of years, but we are actually quite still young as a country. Correct. Um, Ambassador. Many of us don't actually pay attention. Uh, I'll be very honest, if we, if we move around, we don't really give much focus to international relations. And I think that is where we should start off with regards to Mirko right now, or for this afternoon. What is the importance of international relations? What does that do for not only just a country and a, and a government, but a Namibian elsewhere, or a Namibian seeking an opportunity somewhere else, or a Namibian that has found themselves to be somewhere else and, uh, you know, is trying to progress, trying to return, needs assistance. What is the importance of international relations for a country? Thank you very much. I will try to attempt the question with uh, <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah. Now, what is importance of 
international relations for a country. Mm -hmm. Now, international relations are complex. Mm. And as we uh, relate, uh, let's bring it to human relations. Mm -hmm. We need uh, to cooperate mm -hmm. with one another. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the um, international relations, there are actors because it, actors such as state mm -hmm. and non-state actors. The state actors are the state, as in terms of the uh, Montevideo Convention of yes. 26 of December 1933, mm -hmm. that is uh, Article 1, a state as a person of international uh, law must have a, a certain characteristic mm -hmm. that is a, a permanent population, mm. a defined uh, border, borders, mm -hmm. a government, and ability to enter into relation with other nations. Now, because there are so many issues that need cooperations, mm. such as peace, economy, trade, immigrations, mm. when you move around. Mm. Now, this requires cooperations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For example, if we are now going to uh, move to, 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 to regulate the movement of people from one area to another, uh, uh, there are issues of transportations, mm -hmm. there are issues of uh, even the uh, identifications. So, Therefore, you need to cooperate with other states to say uh, if you need a passport, it must meet such certain requirement. When you are flying or, or using a mode of transportation such as air, air, uh, airways, it must meet a certain uh, specifications mm. uh, and as, as well as protections. Mm -hmm. So then you cannot do it alone. You need to uh, do it in relation with others. Yeah. So therefore, it requires international cooperation so that you can interact mm. or, or interact mm -hmm. with other uh, countries or state or member state. Mm -hmm. But you see, the international relations is not only limited to state. It also uh, it, it, the, the state can also uh, enter into the relation with non-state actors. Mm -hmm. So the non-state actors can be an entity that, uh, with influence, mm -hmm. uh, it can be a, a multinational cooperation, mm -hmm. uh, it can be uh, civil societies or, or NGO or international organization. Mm -hmm. But the interaction is aimed at to make the life of, of the people better mm -hmm. so that they do not face problems. For example, they, they could, it, it can be a relation of cultural exchange mm -hmm. between one, uh, people from one country mm -hmm. to another, either students, or it could just be a cultural exchange. Now, those actors in international relations are those that shape the contour of international politics. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it is very important for a country to have an international relation, or what they call foreign policy, mm -hmm. so that it guides the interaction between the, 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 the people of the countries and as well as the people of other countries to, yeah. to, to, to determine that. So, so it is, it, 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 there are benefits from cooperation uh, as countries interact. Mm -hmm. We don't, for example, even the products, we don't produce the same product. Yeah. Uh, there are those who have other products and you want to enter into the uh, trade relation to trade in certain products. Then that agreement that you enter into, to, it will determine how you are going to uh, trade with that relation. So yeah. all those things are international relations. Uh -huh.
Okay, okay. I'm hoping that we have educated somebody this afternoon with regards to the importance of international relations. Because as much as we know that we communicate, we know that we interact at various levels globally, whether regionally, SADC, Africa, or whatever, we don't always you know, tend to focus on how we get to, to, to have these relationships. Now, uh, coming to Mr. Mavuku, we would like to then find out, NPC, um, what is the mandate of NPC? And how does NPC fit in into the, the, the works of all other OMAS in government? Uh, more significantly, the ministries. I think this is the one question that we hardly ever uh, um, uh, hear people asking, but when you do ask the person, what does NPC stand for, what do they do, most of our people don't actually know this. And I think if we're looking at 32 years of, of where, we, where we are right now, the, knowing NPC's mandate and how it fits in would uh, most likely assist somebody out there to know what the role is that NPC has played. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, I think uh, that was quite a mouthful, I must <laughs> say. Yes, but uh, NPC, I think it, uh, uh, in terms of the mandate, it's derived from uh, you know, the, the, the supreme law of the land, that's mm -hmm. the Constitution, Article 129. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, shows that uh, NPC, there should be a National Planning Commission in the office of the president uh, uh, tasked with uh, spearheading uh, you know, the course of national development. Mm. So to that end, there's also uh, an enabling act uh, where NPC, the, the NPC Act uh, 2 of 2013 from that, that act, basically, it, it regulates the powers, uh, functions, and personnel mm. of the National Planning Commission. And then it also provides, in terms of the, the main objectives of the National Planning Commission, mm. uh, some of which the m most important one, uh, the first one, is that of you know, formulating short-term, short medium-term, and uh, long-term uh, national development plans in consultation with uh, regional, regional uh, uh, councils. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe I, I, I speak to that specific one mm -hmm. because there are, there are about six, six objectives, mm -hmm. some of which others include, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the monitoring and evaluation of such plans. Mm -hmm. But then let me just stick to uh, the, the, the first one, that of formulating the NDP, because it speaks directly to the question that you raised. Mm. Yeah, uh, when we develop uh, the, the, the NDPs, uh, because we do it in a consultation with the uh, uh, regional council, mm -hmm. uh, so once the NDP is out there, mm. it's ready for, for use, what is important is that for us to make sure that, because I have to, to indicate that in the formulation process, we make sure that each and every uh, Namibian participates mm. so that it's all Namibians are included in the Namibian house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the moment it's out there, then that that means now there's a need to to implement it. Mm. And how do we do that? Is uh, there are mechanisms? You know, we have lead lead ministries who are involved in the in the process. You have. Uh, uh, Office of the Prime Minister, which is in charge with the uh, performance management uh, system. You have Minister of Urban and Rural Development, who are supposed to to to, to plan mm -hmm. uh, or to develop the NDP together together with us. Mm -hmm. So I think what is also important is that when we have when we have uh, the, the 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 NDP, the it should be cascaded down mm -hmm. to the different OMAs. That is in terms of because different OMAs have to develop uh, their own strat five-year strategic mm -hmm. plans, mm -hmm. which speaks directly to to some of the objectives in, mm -hmm. uh, as outlined in the NDP. Yeah. So the moment that is done, because obviously then it has to be reviewed over over periods, but then it also has to go down. Mm -hmm. you, the strategic plan has to be cascaded down uh, to 
to institutional uh, action plans, mm. annual yeah. action plans. Yeah. And then from those action plans, and then you have now uh, where each and every uh, staff member mm. is obliged now to, in terms of the performance, uh, performance management system, yes. to come up to enter into performance agreements, yeah. annual performance agreements, which have to be evaluated at the end of at the mm -hmm. end of the year. Okay. So in a nutshell, that's where that's where we we, we come in as National Planning Commission. Yeah. It starts yeah. with the planning where we, we we include the planning phase, we include almost everyone mm. in the Namibian House. Mm. You talk about uh, the private sector, the public sector, uh, the the uh, non governmental or civil society organizations, mm. uh, you talk about academia all these because normally we always we often hear people saying no uh, the ndp is just uh, you know a product of npc mm -hmm. or it's just for government but that is not really true mm -hmm. because our view is that we we do it for namibia yeah, yeah. it's not for, for for government or for npc as per se yeah. so that notion i think it should be dispelled okay Okay. No, well, well put, and I do hope, as I said earlier on, that we this platform also creates the opportunity for us to learn. It's not just about us dashing uh, mm. <laughs> random information, but I think it's, it's mm. one of those that we can use, honestly speaking, to educate not just ourselves here, but, you know, generally our, our Namibian mm. nation. Um, as we said, you are uh, welcome to communicate with us on our social media platforms. And we already have a comment here from Richard Kambinda, who is asking or stating, what does the panel have to say to revolutionist histo revisionist pardon me historians who claim uh, fervently insist that grand and petty apartheid was allegedly better than the republic in terms of infrastructure development and human rights for all um, i hope mm. that question came out clear and mm. I'm now not sure who I'm supposed to throw this question to. So maybe, <laughs> Ambassador, you can assist us. First of all, to talk of human rights in apartheid is totally wrong mm. and misguided. Mm. There was no human right mm -hmm. in apartheid. First of all, apartheid was declared mm. a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. by the United Nations. Now, how can it be better than the, a, a sovereign state? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there are no mistakes, but it is misguided for anyone to compare that there was human right during apartheid. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I, I think uh, that is, in the first place, is a it's totally misguided. Yeah. As to other amenity, I, I can't remember because uh, uh, I was born here. Mm. Uh, of course, I went in exile very at the early stage of my age. Mm. Mm. But I cannot remember uh, having the amenities such as when, when I was growing up, I didn't even know the electricity. Yeah, yeah. So how, it can, how can it be better than uh, the independent? I, 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 I simply feel that that is a misguided yeah. remarks. Okay, okay. So, yes, Mr. Daniel, to add on to that. It's to say that the, I think, you know, at the, you know, in his uh, speech, uh, when he was addressing the, the, the just uh, recent uh, independence celebrations, His Excellency actually had, has very well addressed that issue. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would want to encourage uh, Mr. Kambinda just to, uh, you know, the president's statement is, uh, is out there, it's public knowledge. Uh, and he has really put that issue to, to where it belongs. That yeah. uh, is something that a patriotic Namibian and somebody who has really, you know, uh, experienced what apartheid, uh, all the evils that apartheid has, you know, has brought to our society in those years mm -hmm. and in South Africa, you know, would, would never agree. Yeah. To say, you know, even if, as, uh, as Ambassador has indicated, there are challenges that we continue uh, to address, and those challenges are national challenges. Mm -hmm. It's not things that should be left to the government alone, 
but to to imply that uh, you know uh, they, you know there were human rights uh, conditions and even you know more better development in the, in, in you know during that era as yeah. compared to to, yeah. to where we are now, yeah. I think there is something uh, misplaced there. Okay. Now, uh, um, Mr. Kambinda, I hope you, you have received the answer to your question. Um, we have a caller on the line. Mr. Anytime, good afternoon. Welcome to our show this afternoon. Good afternoon to Madam Kahia. How are you this afternoon? No, I am well. How are you? I'm well too. Thank you. And a very good afternoon to the panel there. Yeah, uh, a very, very important uh, topic to critically find on it and to try to look at the, the short cause or the short time in the way our country is written. Looking at the, the years mm. of being independent, the, in my own understanding, yes, we are independent, but economically we are not independent. Mm. That one is, is the effect. Mm. Mm. South Africa is the one playing a role on our economy, especially the supply of the food items. Mm. Economic independence on South Africa is the one that the government should tighten its belt to, re to just detach itself from this economic independence on South Africa. We are not independent economically. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me take it into a nutshell what happened in 2020 when COVID-19 popped in in our country. Mm. Most of the shops, the shop shelves were going empty. And we almost suffered the hunger in this country and even in terms of the clothes. Most of the items that we import from South Africa. Mm. So now if we say 32 years of independence, and with the theme, Mr. Mavosi indicated the theme for this year's, for this year's whatever independence celebration, you yeah. united the people for prosperity. Yeah. Prosperity, the, <clears throat> maybe isolating eco economic perspective there. Okay. Now the question is, how, for how long will we depend on South Africa, yet we call ourselves we are independent? Okay. I cannot call myself any time with independent. I'm working, I graduated, and then I'm working on my own house. Yeah, yeah. But I'm still relying on my parents for food, feeding me all the necessities that I need. Okay. I'm not independent. All right. Okay. Uh, on the sanitation, mm -hmm. uh, I don't really understand the when he, I don't know whether he, um, I forgot the name. Mm -hmm. He indicated that the urban, through urban and rural sanitation. Mm. But are we sure all the informal settlements in Namibia are having a, this is proper sanitation? Mm -hmm. uh, coming from Katima, I will indicate the areas whereby most of the time I read this concerned on people's parliament, on local radio station, Okay. We have a total informal settlement. It's a very big informal settlement in Katima. With cowboy, with the dairy. People, Mr. Mubusi knows what I'm talking about here. Sanitation mm -hmm. is not existing there. Mm -hmm. When the nature calls, people go to the, to, to the bush. Mm -hmm. I need the address, an address on that one. Okay. When we talk about the service, service, servicing the land, in Katima again, whether it's in Rundu, go where people are living in the most informal settlements. Land is just there, and the service people are just dwelling there. Mm -hmm. Can we please talk of uh, united people for prosperity in the critical areas of uh, people's life, other than just on the paper there? Okay. But they, let's ponder on the economic dependency in South Africa. We are okay. not independent today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Anytime for your contribution. That is Anytime there from Tumep. Always a pleasure to have you on our show. And uh, um, any time before we get to the economic emancipation that he's referring to, and I believe even yesterday with yesterday's topic, there was mention to that, that um, following a liberation struggle, there is always a, a, a second step.
to the struggle, which is normally economic emancipation, and this is usually done through uh, social economical development uh, to try and create sustainability within any sovereign state. Am I correct if I put it that way? Okay, and then uh, any times second point spoke to challenges with regards to, to local authorities and so on. And that brings me to actually the next question that I had that I will marry it with a later one. And you can just uh, answer that collectively. Um, my next question was going to then look at uh, um, how many local authorities have we thus far established? Because I do know that they are necessary to assist uh, um, with the runnings and, and, and operations of government at a grassroots level. And then does the ministry assist or support locals in the establishment of these settlement areas? Because there are steps with regards to uh, where you qualify or how you qualify to become a settlement before you become a, a town or a village and so forth. And then marrying it with the statement or the concern that any time had, what are the provisions of town planning in local authorities in relations to frequently experienced challenges that are associated with increased informal settlements, lack of basic services, slow delivery of serviced land, uh, building codes, uh, aging stormwater drainage, and poor solid waste management in these local authorities. It's a mouthful, Indeed. but, but uh, I'm trying to give you an opportunity to, to, to you know, put both right. into one and just give a holistic explanation to that. Okay. No, thank you. Um, if you allow me, let me, you know, um, uh, let me start off by addressing the issue of the economic independence. Mm, mm. Uh, and I'm sure Ambassador may also be better placed to also address that issue. I think... Uh, we, you know, we have to put some of these things in, you know, into context. Mm. Uh, there is no country in the world that is independent in everything. It's not possible. Yeah. It's not possible. Um, because for, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Namibia, as Ambassador was saying, uh, we need to have relations to be able to trade with other nations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay? And what does it mean to trade? It means that you trade in those goods in which you have a comparative and competitive advantage. Mm. Goods that you can produce much cheaper in comparison to other countries. Okay? So you have a niche or you are able to produce them better. So you export those. And when you export to other countries, there is, you know, there is a concept of you know, reciprocity. Mm. Mm. You cannot be expecting that you want to be the one to sell to other countries, but then you don't open your borders to other countries to also sell what they produce. Yeah. So it's important. So... so so there are certain goods that we can say we have a competitive or comparative advantage. For instance, beef. Okay? We export beef. We produce the best beef. It's known. But we also need other types of meat which we may not be able to produce competitively or other goods. So it's not possible for us to be completely independent. But I hear the point uh, that, the, you know, that the fellow, I mean the caller has indicated to say, less we need to do more to be able to have a very strong industrial base, local yeah. industrial base. Yeah, that is, yeah. I, I think, the point that he's making. And that weakness in our structure, you know, in the structure of our economy, was brought out when the COVID pandemic came. Very even much. masks, even sanitizers, basics, okay, we import. Um, but I think over the years, you know, over the years we have made some advances mm -hmm. uh, to try to build some of these industries. I remember even during COVID, uh, we were able to unleash some of the potential that we have. Uh, for instance, UNAM for, for, for one and other labs in the country mm -hmm. were able to produce sanitizers. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And then you also look at, you know, uh, we had even in the prison services, in the prisons we also have the Ministry of Industrialization and Trade also mobilized uh, small SME producers to produce masks. So we were able to turn that, that calamity into, into an opportunity for us to unleash. Mm -hmm. But I agree with the colleagues to say we need to do more so that then you know, our dependency on, on other nations is reduced. Now back to the issue uh, that, 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 you, that, that he has raised regarding informal settlement. I cannot agree more with him. Mm -hmm. I am also familiar with, uh, you know, with the situation, uh, particularly in, in Katimamulilo, which he has indicated, Choto, mm -hmm. Cowboy, all this location, we are aware of the challenge that is there. Mm -hmm. And that challenge is not only peculiar to that, it's a national challenge of informal settlement. And as you recall, His Excellency has actually declared 
the, the situation, the living conditions in informal settlements in the country, mm. you know, as a, as a humanitarian crisis that requires urgent action. And, and you are responding to that. And that response is a collective one. Yeah. Uh, through local authorities such as the, uh, the, the one of Katima Mulilo and others, you know, we are taking measures to address the conditions of informal settlement. And uh, just to answer your question, we have a total of 57 local authorities in the country. Mm. That's what we have. And those local authorities are classified either to be a municipality, a municipality, you have like Vintuk, Swakopmon, and Wafish Bay, who are part one municipalities. Those are the big ones mm. um, who are expected to receive only very limited subventions, maybe only for targeted capital projects, but otherwise they are supposed to survive on their own. Mm. But for, for municipalities like Vintuk, because of the draw, everybody wants to come to the capital city for obvious reasons. Um, the, 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 in, that influx has created um, a burden, you know, which cannot be left alone to the municipality to address. Yeah. And that's why government has come in. In, in Vintuk in particular, we have come very strong in terms of assisting them to address the informal settlements, you know, uh, in, in around the town, including a housing program which was launched a few years back mm. where, where we are, uh, one, we are, we are, um, upgrading the informal settlements mm, mm. Uh, through uh, budgetary provisions, a subsidy that is given to local authorities, mm. and then they plan and service the land. And uh, we agree that not we have not reached all the areas where our people are currently informally living. Mm. Uh, and, and by informal settlements, we're basically talking about an area which is inhabited by people, but that area is not planned yet. Mm. Mm. So you don't have a demarcation as to a plot from where, you know, who lives where and all that. People are just living on the land. And also there's also not planning of services. There's no planning of services and also the services have not also been brought to that area. Not to talk of a proper housing we need to follow, you know, with that. So I think I, I cannot agree more with him that uh, we need to do more in this, in this area of, of formalizing informal settlement. As a matter of fact, under the Harambe Prosperity too. We have, uh, as one of our deliverables, we have set ourselves to, to design an informal settlement upgrading strategy. And we just had the stakeholders a consultation a few weeks back uh, where we were coming up with the assistance of the UN Habitat. Uh, we have already started a draft and UNAM, uh, sorry, and, and NAST. Mm -hmm. NAST has been contracted to lead you know, in the compilation of that strategy and implementation plan. Yeah. Together with that, we have also uh, we are also reviewing our housing policy uh, to be able to make sure that it continues to be relevant and is uh, responding to the needs uh, of, the, you know, of the country. Um, so I cannot agree more with him. He's, uh, he's correct to say, and you have also acknowledged it in the beginning, mm. to say, yes, we have those numbers that we have, uh, uh, you know, in terms of what we have been able to do, but the problem continues to be there. A yeah. lot of yeah. fellow Namibians still need access to a piece of land and also for them to be assisted um, to get, uh, you know, a proper shelter over their, over their heads. So, and then you also have asked a question on um, how does uh, an area become proclaimed as a, either as a local authority and uh, upgraded from being a settlement. Settlements are, are growth points, areas that are populated, and there is uh, activities in them, but those areas are not proclaimed as local authorities. Mm. And they are un under the administration of a regional council. Okay? They are under the administration of a regional council. Mm. And, the ones the, you know, and, the, and the responsibility of a regional council in terms of the administration of a settlement is for them to develop and administer that area as though it is a local authority area, mm -hmm. which then means that whatever development initiatives and the services that are required to be provided in a proclaimed urban or local authority area mm. is the same that is supposed to be done in a settlement which is under the administration of a regional council. Okay. Okay? And once, and once um, the, the, there is enough ground and what, what precipitates and or triggers for an area to be considered to be upgraded from being a settlement into a local authority is simply that we commission a socioeconomic uh, assessment study. Oh. Because one of the main uh, requirements is that uh, if that area, that area is supposed to be able to be governed as a unit mm. and the people that are residing there should be able to have access to basic services. Yeah. So if there's, not, you know, if there's no water storage reservoir, 
okay? And then there is no proper uh, sanitation or sewer lines or, or you know, you know, and networks mm. where if you connect the houses, then people will be able to dispose of. You know, there is no proper roads, there is no provision for land and all that. Then it becomes difficult for that area to become, to become uh, 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 local authorities because then they will be, you will be expecting the people to demand services and also to be charged for those services. Yeah, yeah. There should be a provision even how to meter. So there must be networks on where, how you supply the services yeah. and also how you meter and then also build the, res, you know, the, the residence. Yeah, okay. So those are the, the, the requirements for an area that we need to first of all conduct a socioeconomic uh, um, you know, potential yeah. uh, study and then that will then inform to say, I think this area is ripe. Yeah. It's ripe to be, you know, to, to self-administered. Uh, okay, okay. I actually learned today. I didn't know some of these things uh, um, were lined up the way that you are stating right now, especially um, the, 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 the management of settlements under regional councils. councils. That I am also learning. They say every day you learn something new, and I am educating myself today. Uh, good afternoon to the caller that we have on the line. Welcome to the show. Yes. Madam Kahia. Oh, yes, anytime. Yes, the way I've been answered, it's like uh, maybe it's a spark. Uh, Mr. Daniel, the reality is just the reality. I would like to make clarification on the point of economic dependence. Okay. I did not say that uh, Namibia should be isolated completely from uh, economic ties with other countries. No. Okay. The point and the easily put was that much of the dependence is on South Africa, right? Mm -hmm. I can give an example of our neighboring country, like even in Zambia, for instance. They produce most of their. Okay. Uh, that's the point. I did not mm -hmm. say that we should do isolated the economically from the rest of the world. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. I think I think uh, uh, coming to the point of uh, the sanitation, I am uh, a bona fide resident of uh, Zambezi region. I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, the ta Katimam Little Town Council has, uh, he, you know, given a portion of land at Nova. These people, uh, they are, these people are crying every day on a open, local open line of uh, Zambezi region. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is no, there are no services there. The roads see nothing. Water, they are being provided with a water tank, which uh, supplies water maybe twice in a week. I, I'm not sure w how many times. When okay. it, we come to the latrines in Choto, bad boy, can we go there today, Madam Kaya? Yeah. There are no latrines there. Okay. So let's be, be practical and be very, very genuine when it comes to issues pertaining to the livelihood of these residents of the nation. The, 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 the citizens of this sovereign state. Okay. No, anytime. Yes, thank you, thank very, you very much, much for your participation. And I think uh, um, yourself and the panelists here are actually speaking the same, same. language. Because if we're looking at, uh, at, 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 uh, or at the issue of economic emancipation, they are just marrying the fact that as much as we need to find ways to become sustainable as a nation, to a majority of percentage with regards to what we produce and what our nation needs, the, the concept of international relations is still necessary to allow for prosperous growth as a nation because as much as we are a country, a sovereign country, we are still part of a, a, a global and very much an African uh, uh, community. We, we are not an, <laughs> an island. We are not the only ones on, on earth. So I think uh, anytime we do share your sentiments very much and I think as a country we, we we have become aware and I think COVID really has exacerbated the rate at which we acknowledge some of these needs and, and what needs to be done and I'm sure uh, institutions uh, for example the NPC is, is also you know 
putting these things into plans on how best they, uh, as a nation, we can go around uh, finding ways to ensure that we do not become crippled when anything happens. I mean, it is very clear, not just COVID, but for example, the war that we have in uh, between the Russia-Ukraine war currently is affecting so many other things as well. And many of us will look at it as if, you know, it's, 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 not, it's got nothing to do with us, but it has a major effect. Fuel prices alone are affecting uh, food prices. I mean, the price of cooking oil, two liters has shot up to almost $100. So. It's, it's those little things that we're referring to with regards to the need for continued growth with regards to international relations. And when it comes to, to, to sanitation and so on, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Daniel, you did re-emphasize that, the f that, that uh, you know, that fight has actually been declared as, as um, what were your words exactly? A, a humanitarian crisis. Yes, a humanitarian crisis. So I think it's just about identifying which areas uh, need to be prioritized and we work from that line of approach. We've got Silas on the line from Vintip. Good afternoon. Silas, thank you and welcome uh, to our show. How are you this afternoon? Um, all right. Good afternoon, my darling, and good afternoon to your listeners. Good afternoon to your guests. Yes. How would you like to contribute this afternoon? Thank you. Two points I have to be discussed with you and assisted. First one, um, global uh, disaster that we are all facing in, the crisis in prices and all these things. Uh, I think it's a hard time. Sorry, Silas, can you repeat that again? The global disaster with regards to? Uh, global disaster and a global economic downfall. Okay. And all this type of attitude we are seeing the global is facing in, in terms of uh, oppressing other nations because of what other nations do not occur to have in their own presence. That is the first thing I want to address. And this is a wake-up call to Africa governments in their own particular states that they need to take advantage in certain occasions when our brothers and sisters in European nations have been attacked each other. First one, you have a lot of opportunities that you are able to be used, utilized in the moment. Mm. Time is money. And your utilizing of all your sources that you have, you can also just make use of it and to make Africa a country that, a nation that will be benefiting with the resources that you have. Yeah. Now, as uh, we are going back to the water and, uh, and uh, uh, human resources, to the capability in the resources of, of a human being, to the, the media, I, I myself sitting in this country, I listen to your... Uh, your um, representative, I don't know whether he is coming from municipality or, or the, any municipal representing, but he points me an issue that I came inside to also say something behalf of what my father just facing in his own region. And Thomas region, we are facing most of this issue that he over, that you have a resettlement which are being given to certain people in this country for 1991 to 1992. Upon these issues are not familiar addresses to the municipality, giving, uh, giving these people to build in their own houses. And then what we have is people are being put in there as a slave. When I mean slave is people are paying services double. And from 1990 to, nine, to 2022, that is 32 or 31 years in the line. Do you think that these people are insufficient in economic of whatever our dear brother is saying in the media now that okay. you are protecting the interests of the municipality that are milking the people okay. and destroying the economic of these people's future? That is why I'm saying that if we are want to be honest as leaders, as a citizen in our country, 
then you must be able to fight for your rights of your citizens for mm -hmm. the telling the municipality to give these people a right to build their own houses because okay. NHG cannot build, municipality will not build. But the only way you can do it is to tell these people, give them permission, make them to register their, their, their houses, yes. whatever place yes. they want to build in, then they can build. That is the okay. only way you can be able to save this yeah. piece of uh, of a uh, uh, rapid of uh, Kambashu. Okay, uh, Silas, I think your point has been well received. Thank uh, you very uh, much. Um, thank you darling. very much. Uh, we can see the, the your passionate contribution. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank and we will much. and we will pass this on to the panelists. Thank um, you very much. International. Uh, uh, um, there was an international point or international relations, uh, a point that Silas brought there. Maybe Ambassador, you can just comment on that one. Uh, before I go to uh, the point that uh, Sirius has raised, mm. I, I want to just touch briefly on the uh, economic independence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think when I was uh, explaining the international relations, perhaps I forgot mm. some important uh, aspect related to the uh, international relations, yes. particularly uh, to, uh, for the foreign policy. Mm -hmm. First, mm -hmm. The foreign policy or international relation policy of any country mm. is a reflection of domestic uh, narratives. Mm. Then uh, the others is uh, it has an element of protection. Mm. It has an element of promotion and mm -hmm. advancing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, coming to this question of uh, economic independence, uh, yes, I do agree to the extent the, uh, uh, what the caller said, mm -hmm. that you need to be independent. Because first is political independence, which must complement mm. economic independence. Yeah. Now, the uh, executive director here has, uh, has pointed it out that uh, perhaps, uh, as he was uh, alluding to, mm. that if you go to the, most of the shares, these are products from uh, our neighbors yeah. across the, the, the origin. Mm. Uh, and then uh, the executive director also touched on the issue of uh, production capacity. Now, if we need to boost up our industrial and our production capacity so that we do not have to import toothpick uh, we must produce uh, certain things here inside the country. Mm. Then gradually we then reduce that dependency. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have, if there's nothing that can replace what is on the shelf, because mm. these are people who are, who are procuring yeah. product to sell yeah. here. Exactly. So if there is no alternative, what, what, what then? So, so we need to take your cognizance of that mm. gap Mm -hmm. and feel it as quickly Very as much. possible. Yeah. Now, coming then to this question of... Uh, uh, he was talking of global disaster. I was fighting with myself whether he was referring to the environment or he's referring to the crisis. But I, I perhaps can say that he was referring to uh, a issue of uh, international peace and security because mm -hmm. he mentioned uh, Europe. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the fundamental uh, 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 objective of mm. international relations, particularly to policies, is peace. Yeah, yeah. The maintenance of peace and security is vital because in the absence of international peace and security, mm. then there can be no development. Mm -hmm. And of course, I heard, uh, as you were talking to uh, 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 Dr. Gudumo, mm -hmm. he, he was saying, uh, uh, peace is not necessarily absence of war. Yeah. It's the conditions mm -hmm. that are existing. Now, we need, we as people, mm -hmm. we need to create those conditions yeah. that are uh, conducive mm -hmm. for, the, for peace to exist. Yeah. So that our neighbor should also take cognizance that you do not engage in activities that are likely to reduce my peace. Mm. 
mm. to, to a low level. So that is no longer peace. So we need to live in peace in the way also enhances mm -hmm. others' uh, peace. Because if you, if you only consider about your peace and you do not take into consideration peace of other, other people's peace, yeah. then you are not enhancing peace. Yeah, yeah. You are undermining it. Very much. Okay. Um, we are definitely continuing with this particular topic because it's a broad one. It's a heavy one, if one could call it that. It's a heavyweight topic for this afternoon that has multiple aspects to it. But unfortunately, we do need to bid our NBC viewers farewell at this point. Uh, thank you very much to our NBC viewers for making the time to join us uh, through this conversation. But please be reminded that you can still follow us on all our social media platform as a ministry, on on Facebook, you can find us at the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology, Republic of Namibia. That is on Facebook. Ministry of Information and Communication uh, Technology, the Republic of Namibia. We are also on our YouTube channel where we are streaming from as well. That is MICT Namibia. MICT Namibia is our handle there. You can continue to engage us. But uh, with our NBC viewers, you, uh, you are welcome very much to join us on our next topic that will be on Monday um, at 3 o'clock. For the rest, let us continue and you can call in, in as well. Now, continuing with our topic, um, we continuing uh, to with our topic here. Uh, we would actually like to have a, a refocus at NPC, and uh, from their mandate, they are to ensure the implementation of the national development plans. Uh, Mr. Mavuku had probably started wondering when when are we going to give the microphone back to him. Um, we want to know what are some of the priorities that NPC is currently uh, focusing on. Th thank you very much for the question. And uh, Before I attempt to, to answer it, I wanted to just add one dimension to the economic independence that we're talking about. Yes, very yeah, much. I think uh, at, from, from the supreme law of the land, the mm -hmm. Constitution, I, I don't know whether it's Article 95 or 98, speaks of the economic order of mm -hmm. Namibia. Mm -hmm. and that is, uh, it should be based on the, the the economic of Namibia should be based on the principles of a mixed economy. That is where you have both public and private contracting. Yes. So ideally, also what we, want, what we have to understand is that for government, the role as a government is for us to, to put policies in place so that you know, uh, the businesses out there can flourish. Yes. Yes. So in, in, in reflecting uh, those, uh, those issues, I wanted to, to cite one example. Uh, the stock of uh, this reliance to, uh, to, from, uh, in terms of uh, the different goods and services from South Africa. Mm -hmm. But then uh, as a government, I should also indicate uh, one example where by, if you look at the horticulture industry, yes. that is where you have your fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. in Namibia. So government specifically, came up with, you know, uh, a, a deliberate policy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. targeting specifically to ensure that, you know, this, you know, uh, the, the, the fruits and vegetables produced here, they also get shelf space. Yes. Yes. So that came uh, about by having, you know, a mutual agreement between both the traders and the producers. Mm. And at the time, uh, the thinking was that they should be, uh, the, 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 the policy was around what was called uh, market share promotion, mm -hmm. MSP in short. Yes. So basically what it implied was that because the traders, they have to, to source, you know, they have to buy uh, the, the, the produce uh, from, from producers. Mm -hmm. But then realizing that most of the, the, the traders were buying from, from, from South Africa or other countries, mm -hmm. uh, then that, 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 uh, that, that uh, MSP was introduced because it, with that policy, it was indicating that out of their total turnover, a certain uh, proportion should be sourced locally. Mm -hmm. And it started at the beginning of 2000, it started around 5%. Mm -hmm. 
And as we speak right now, it's close to 50%. Wow. So I think that is uh, an achievement. Very much. So, and, and I wanted to, to, uh, to remind uh, any time that when he goes to these retail outlets, ShopRite, shop uh, Pick and Pay, you often see, or Food Lovers Market, you mm. often see a section indicating this is Namibian produce. Mm. It's basically as a result of, of that, okay. promoting, you know, local produced Namibian products. Okay. So in okay. terms of uh, uh, fresh produce, uh, that has been uh, quite an achievement. I, but I know, I understand that there's still so many that we can do. Mm. Yes, now coming to, to, to the question in terms of our priorities, uh, as, as uh, National Planning Commission, whenever we develop our plans, they are mostly uh, centered on the, what they call the, three, the triple evils mm -hmm. or the triple challenges, that is of uh, 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 inequality, uh, poverty, and unemployment. Yeah. So basically, by and large, even if you look at if you look at all the NDPs that we are we are formulating, we the idea is that these are the priority areas. Mm -hmm. We want to see at the end of the day, we want to see that the there are employment opportunities created. At the same time, we are also reducing the poverty, mm -hmm. and then we are also reducing uh, in income inequality. Yeah. But then, even if you look at uh, the, the the progress so far you will see that uh, in terms of poverty, we really managed to, to halve the poverty rate uh, from, 2000, uh, from two, 2009-10 financial year to 2015-16. Mm. It because it stood at 28, around 28.8%, but mm -hmm. then that was brought down to 17.4%, okay. which was quite you know, uh, significant because we achieved the, the mil Millennium Development Goals target mm -hmm. by then. Mm -hmm. But then in terms of uh, uh, income inequality, uh, we've been reducing it as well. Mm -hmm. But then it's not at the pace uh, that we expected. Yeah. Because if you look at Vision 2030, we are saying by the year 2030, income inequality should basically be around, uh, around uh, 0.3. Wow. For now, as we speak, it's uh, at 0.56. But then, at independence in 93, after independence 93, 94, it was at 0 0.7. Okay. But by 2015-16, it had declined to 0 0.56. Mm -hmm. So one can already see that it's, of course, it's reducing. Yeah. But then from the vision, again, the intention was that uh, we should achieve an annual reduction rate of about 3% per year. Ah. Okay. But then if you look at uh, the trend uh, over the years, uh, up coming from 0 0.7, 1993, 94 to 0.56 in 2015-16, you see that annually if you take the growth trend, if you do a bit of number crunching, you you see that the level of reduction mm -hmm. has been below below the 3%. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So basically, but then in terms of uh, unemployment, on the other hand, uh, it has also been uh, uh, declining. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, I think some years, was it 2008, when it was reported at over 50%. But then coming down to 2018, it was brought down to uh, 34%. But then all these, all these three, three challenges, the expectation is that we need uh, robust growth. Yeah robust economic growth if we are to really make sure that we, we, we make that uh, significant dent on all of them. Okay. But then since uh, 20, 2016, mm -hmm. our economy has been in a recession okay. due to various a combination yeah. of factors, external and, and internal. Mm -hmm. You talk about the issue of recurring droughts over the years which impacted both uh, uh, the, uh, humans and, and, and animals as well. Mm -hmm. And then you also talk about the issue of uh, the, 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 the commodity prices. Yeah. Because we yeah. know that Namibia is uh, rich, uh, richly endowed with mineral resources. Okay. But those prices of which we don't have control over yeah. have you know, been, been uh, fluctuating so much. Okay. So that also is a bearing in how we, we perform as a country. And okay. then in addition to that, we also experienced the investment investment has also been declining, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. from uh, 2016. 
because uh, from 2010 to 2015, we experienced uh, what, what, what you can term as a construction boom. Mm -hmm. So in, inflation, I mean, uh, investment back then was, was quite high. It was yeah. quite significant, mainly driven by uh, mining sector. Okay. Because there was uh, you know, a new, new construction of new mines as well as expansion of those existing ones. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, the, this is where we are. Okay. And maybe before I conclude, uh, I almost forgot, because in, as a result of, because uh, we had, from 2016, the economy was uh, declining so much mm -hmm. that uh, by then came the elephant in the room, COVID, mm -hmm. which saw, you know, our economy uh, recording its uh, biggest contraction yeah. or decline yeah. since since independence yeah. which is a decline of 8.5 wow. percent which has been the highest yeah. since so you can already imagine that what that means is that you know the achievements made mm -hmm. in terms of the challenges that i've uh, alluded to uh, poverty mm -hmm. income mm -hmm. inequality mm -hmm. and the unemployment those challenges have in a way have yeah. been reversed yeah so it's like so, a you had a, a spanner being thrown in your wheel kind of effect. And that yes. is actually grave disappointment. And thus again, I think as a nation, this is where we now need to really, more than ever, come together to try and make sure that we get back on track. Um, we need to, to round up, but there is an elephant in this room that we would like to, <laughs> we would like to throw at, at Mr. Daniel before we sign off. Um, land as a commodity is perceived, uh, it's perceived to be Ex um, exorbitantly priced, very high. Uh, what factors determine the price for land? I think this is one thing that we need to kind of get out there as short as possibly as you can. And um, the question is also, is this pricing, is this cost linked to the cost of servicing the land? And are there any plans by government to, to try and assist or even mitigate uh, um, and maybe create like a baseline for pricing to try and ensure that land is available to, if not all, but as many people or many Namibians as possible. Thank you. Um, yeah. The, yeah, this, you know, access to land continues to be really a burning issue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe, you know, and before I directly respond to your question, just briefly, the last caller raised an issue of uh, that we should, uh, you know, uh, harness the involvement of communities mm. in building their own houses. Yeah. And we should, and, you know, and it's linking to, you know, to the issue of access to land. I cannot agree more with him mm. that uh, community-led initiatives uh, are much more sustainable and will assist the government to deliver on the national mandate. And uh, we have, as a government, through the issuance of certificates, I'm sure you've been following in Vintuk, yes, uh, yes. where people who are living in informal settlements have been residing in these areas, they are now being given you know, occupational rights. Mm -hmm. uh, to say from today on this area, we recognize you that, and we give you the right to be here, and you can therefore build a permanent structure mm -hmm. on your own with your time. Yeah. And that is what we believe in. And then formally through budgeting, we provide uh, money through uh, community-led organizations such as the Shark Dwellers Federation. Over the past uh, uh, two or three years, we have been giving them at least uh, 10 million you know, every financial year. Mm. So that then you know, people like that, and they, and, and, they, and they say they don't want handouts, and that is what we believe in, people working for themselves. Yeah. So you see women, you know, um, especially women and men, you know, they are digging trenches to lay the pipes for water and services, and they also pull labor to build their own houses. Mm -hmm. And that's why we come in a government and then give them that little uh, uh, catalytic uh, uh, support. Yes. Um, so we believe, I cannot agree more with him. Now, inputs into land servicing, really. Um, the issue, we agree that there is much that needs to be done mm -hmm. to really uh, put some order into our economy. Um, it is accepted that we are, we are a, a mixed economy mm -hmm. and therefore, uh, not everything can be regulated. We have to allow a space for the private sector to play in. But yet we also want, uh, you know, where people make profit or when they do business, they have that human, that human consideration to it. They, yes. we, we all have a moral obligation uh, to, the, to, the, to the next. We are our brother or sister's keeper. And therefore, in whatever we do, we need to make sure that the, the, the product that we produce, whether it's service land, 
is correctly priced. Yeah. It must be a, a true reflection of what is priced. Now, when it comes to land, you know, this is you know, some of the following inputs. Um, for every piece of land, the law requires that before that land can be sold and even declared as a township, which is the first stage, mm -hmm. is that there, sh there should be an environment impact assessment study done. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need to contract an environmentalist to conduct that study. Mm -hmm. There is money there. Yeah. The next stage is that we need that area to be surveyed. Mm -hmm. Okay? Subdivided and then uh, pegs are put in that, you know, in that, you know, you know, to divide the, 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 the land, yeah. you know, into, into, into stands or urban, as we call them. You need a surveyor to be able to do that. Mm. There is a cost attached to it. Mm. Then you then go to the town planning. You need a special, you know, you know that will be a town or urban planner mm. to come in again and to plan the land, come up with the layout. Again, you need to pay that town plan. Government does not have that capacity, and most of the local authorities, except of the few big ones like Vintuk, mm -hmm. have town planners on their establishment. Yeah. Otherwise, we have to source that, that, uh, that services from the market, and it comes at a price, yeah. okay? And then after that, then you need to engage an engineer to be able to design the underground and the overhead, and the overhead services that are to be, to be put there. And it's only after the design and you pay that engineer, then you then get the contractor who now digs and installs the services. You see, so all that cost, yeah. all that cost. And again, it depends also the topography. You know, yeah. for areas that are mountainous like in Vintuk, that services comes very pricey. Yeah. But if you go to areas with soft sand like most part of the north, then you expect that at least that cost, you know, is reduced. Yeah. But generally, I think the outcry of the, of, the, of the citizens is really to say, are these costs really, you know, or prices truly cost reflective? Or yeah. there is a lot of markups and, prof yeah. and profit built in that is really chopping in. The other issue is also, it depends on the source of funding. Mm -hmm. What is the cost of the money that is being used to service? Mm -hmm. If that money is borrowed from the bank where there is uh, interest on it, then you will have to be able also to put something on top and also be able to still be paying back that loan. Yeah. So all that cost will be built into the final, uh, this thing. Yeah. Now, what we have been doing uh, as a government, especially for the ultra law and the low income is that a uh, government provides subsidies mm. to local authorities. Okay. And we, and they are directed to ensure that that limited funding from the state, which is taxpayers' payers money, mm -hmm. really goes to address the needs of the most needy. Yeah. So that then that land can be correctly priced. We also call upon uh, local authorities and, uh, and, and state agencies to make sure that we, don't, we are not simply uh, price takers. Yeah. You go into the market, you ask for bids, and whatever you get for the market is what you end up paying. Yeah. Let's negotiate. Let's determine that truly this price is fair yeah. and there's value for money. Yeah. And truly, yeah. if there's value, that value should be able to be passed to the, to the end user. Yeah. So I think these are the issues that we, 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 we are addressing. Mm -hmm. we, we are embarking on a number of reforms. Um, in the past, we used to have uh, some institutions that, like NAMPAP, which is the Namibia Planning uh, Advisory Board, mm -hmm. uh, which is involved in the approval of land. So, but we have since reformed, and with the new Urban and Regional Planning Act, we have now removed the two bodies that used to be there, mm -hmm. uh, NAMPAP and the Township Boards. We have merged them now into one single body, uh, and therefore, that has been able to, to really uh, expedite the approval of applications for townland, uh, you know, for, for township establishment. Yeah. Um, and the board really is working in such a way that, uh, uh, you know, every month, even in the middle, after each meeting, they certify their minutes. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, so we don't have any more backlogs in terms yeah. of the approval of yeah. township establishment through that reform. Uh, there's also provision, you know, uh, through that law, where certain uh, approvals or decisions that used to be done at the center, mm -hmm. such as approval of rezoning uh, and, and, you know, you know, and all that, uh, has now been decentralized to local uh -huh. authorities. So it yeah. can be done, it doesn't need to come to the minister yeah. anymore. Uh, all, all what is required is simply for local authorities to be able to have on their structure mm -hmm. either a registered town planner, Mm -hmm. who will be able to undertake that yes. planning, uh, this thing. Or otherwise, they are also allowed to appoint 
um, a planner who is a, who you know who is a private yeah. planner and then therefore uh, and enlisted to be able to to conduct that and then so that then some of those decisions can be done at the local you know at the level. local authority level yeah. and hopefully it can give more traction to things to be done much more quicker yeah yeah. Okay. Um, I always stated, and I will keep restating it, time is never enough. Time is never enough. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to give the ambassador just the opportunity to give his final words as well, and uh, then we wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think my final thought is just as we reflect on these 32 years of uh, uh, independence, mm -hmm. uh, First of all, we just need to understand that uh, international relations, e there are forces yeah. that are shaping the contour mm -hmm. of geopolitics. Yeah. Uh, and, and these forces, uh, we need to take uh, cognizant of them. Mm. Uh, and, and because everything is revolved about, uh, around power mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and control, yeah. uh, so that we are not pushed aside. Mm. We need to clearly uh, identify mm -hmm. our interest that we pursue. Mm. And we, find, we craft a strategy. Mm. Because when you are operating in the world that is messy, yeah. it is like uh, you are going into a, a pond. And if you are going to fish, mm. with what are you going to fish with? Exactly. So you have to know the level of the water yeah. and take appropriate apparatus to yeah. fish. Now, Namibia has uh, played a role in this. Uh, as you know, uh, we have been member of the Security Council, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and during our membership, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, 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 on, on um, the resolution, during, during the presidency of Namibia, the Security Council, mm -hmm. resolution 1325 on women yeah, in peace, yeah was adopted yes, by the council. Yes. And it was Namibia, uh, in the person of Ambassador Jamba, yes. that graveled it. Mm -hmm. Namibia has also uh, participated in peacekeeping operations mm. in Cambodia, mm -hmm. in Liberia, in Angola, mm. uh, uh, in Sudan, in South Sudan, mm. and, and many other places, and yes. continue to do so. Yes. Mm. Uh, Namibia has chaired the SADC the organ, mm. and we are about to, as from August this year, mm. Namibia is going to chair the organ of, of, of SADC. Mm. And we have also played a role within the continental body, mm. the, Af the, uh, the African Union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have been a member of the uh, AU Peace and Security Council, and as of uh, 1st of April, mm. Namibia is again going to uh, play its role as a member of the African Union of Peace and Security Council. So there are many things, but just to sum up, mm. uh, the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation is charged with the responsibility of managing mm. the relations, mm. that, such as protection of our citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had uh, uh, um, students who were coming in, in yes, Ukraine. Yes. And the ministry played a role mm. in coordination with our embassies around there mm. to make sure that the welfare of our students and citizens who are in Ukraine are protected. Yeah. So these are the same. So to, 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 to conclude, mm. uh, there is a, a, one of the professors who said, the world, imperfect as it is from rational point of view, mm. is a result of forces that are inherent of human nature mm. to improve the world one must with work with these forces, not against them. Yeah, yeah. That was Professor Hans Mungenthal. Yeah, that's very good. Definitely strong, strong uh, uh, words that we conclude on for the afternoon. Thank you very much for those who uh, participated. Thank you very much for those who tuned in to this particular topic. It was 32 years of Namibia's in, uh, independence in perspective. Uh, definitely not enough time because, as I stated at some point, it is a very heavy topic. 32 years, 
young, old, uh, that is uh, up to you how you perceive it. But progress is being made, I believe, uh, as a sovereign democratic country. We are trying, we are moving forward to try and establish uh, a stage where we are uh, emancipated economically, uh, but also part of a global village. It takes all of us united for prosperity. Uh, that was the theme for independence, and it speaks volumes to what it is that we need to do with regards to achieving and attaining the goals and aims that we have for ourselves as Namibians and participants of the global village. With that said, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you to our panelists for being part of the conversation. And from myself, Shianwa Desaya Kahiha, and my production team, bye-bye.